Hello, everyone. Welcome. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Sierra, and I'm the Director of Admissions and Program Services at the Data Incubator, and we are a fellowship, scholarship, and placement company. We've promised you an excellent info session today that will be led by one of our instructors, Anna, who will introduce herself very soon, and we'll be walking you through data ethics, why it's important, what that is, and Anna will be sharing some um, great information with us later on in the presentation today. A couple of things that I wanted to go over with you all. So to start things off, oh, actually, I think we're going to start off with a quick overview of our programs and everything that we offer. And then I will hand off to Anna, who will lead us through our discussion, and we'll leave some time for questions at the end. Just a couple of housekeeping items. Today's session is scheduled to last one hour, including our Q&A session. All participants are muted to enable speakers to answer as many questions as possible. So if you do have a question, we encourage you to put your question in the Q&A box. The chat box will be used for general program announcements and resources. So please avoid using the chat box to ask questions for the panelists. We wanna make sure that we don't miss any of your questions. And if you have a question that we either don't get to because of timing or you don't feel comfortable asking in a group audience, you're always welcome to email us at admissions at the datingcubator.com. We'll be happy to schedule some time to talk with you outside of the session. And then lastly, a recording of this session will be sent to all registered attendees. It takes anywhere from 48 to 72 business hours after we conclude the session today. So we'll start off with an instructor introduction. So I will pass to Anna. Thank you, Sierra. Uh, I'm Anna. As Sierra said, I am one of the instructors um, at the Data Incubator. Uh, so I've been um, with the Data Incubator for several years now. I was in our New York office for the longest time, and I relocated to Berlin, Germany now. My background is physics, and from there I kind of meandered into uh, data science. And um, so if you join the program, I'd be very happy to meet you. Thanks, Anna. So a little bit more about our programs before we get into our presentation today. So if you're not very familiar with the Data Incubator, the Data Incubator focuses on training people to become data scientists and data engineers. And some people may ask, you know, why is that important? Well, it's really because data professionals have the ability to work with the latest tools on unstructured and structured data to drive business value for them. This is a big need in the world right now. We work with companies in a variety of industries, ranging from tech to retail, healthcare, and many more. You can probably name a company and they have data that they want to use to drive value for them. So we know there are a lot of other data-focused programs out there. So I'm sure you're wondering what we do at the Data Incubator that's just a little bit different. Well, what we found is when you look at training, there are really two different types of training. There's one that is fast paced and efficient and the other that's slower and focuses on understanding and completion rates. University is one example where you'll receive a more detailed understanding, but with a lot more time invested. And then on the job training is usually very quick and efficient, but maybe you're not fully understanding what you're learning. Well, we've taken all of these aspects and combined them together to find a great middle ground for training. Our program is fast paced. You walk out of the program knowing a lot about data science and data engineering, but most importantly, it's based in real world business applications. And you'll also walk out of the program with a deeper understanding similar to what you would receive at university. All of our instructors are PhD and master's holders, and many of them have completed this program themselves. So they know how to provide that in-depth training that you're looking for. And for our spring 2023 cohort, we'll be offering three data-focused programs, our full-time data science program, our part-time data science program, and also our full-time data engineering program. I wanna take some time to review the similarities for the all three of our program offerings. All of our programs are very intense. They are built around hands-on data-focused curriculums. And we offer full-time and part-time for our data science and full-time for data engineering but all of our programs are packed with a lot of information and tools. Each week we'll focus on a different data tool or approach. And in addition to our lectures, we have our students participate in hands-on practice. And we really believe in fostering an interactive learning environment. And so in each program, students will work on a mini project or mini projects uh, that focus on the tools that you're studying for that week. Additionally, our programs are very collaborative. 
We want our students not only to work with their colleagues and instructors, but we also want you to have the opportunity to network and connect with our hiring partners. Uh, in conjunction with that, our programs are also very career focused. We have career coaches that help you succeed in your data focused career. We have career search workshops. You'll work with a number one resume writing company to get a new resume and cover letter. And we also offer a variety of career services for all of our students throughout the program. And lastly, all of our programs are interactive. Every student in our program is provided a Jupyter server for the duration of the course. So you can follow along and lecture and see and edit raw code that's being run. And you're also able to receive immediate feedback via our interactive grader. So for our full-time data science program, this lasts for eight weeks with classes held daily. You can expect to spend about 30 to 40 hours per week outside of class working on your assignments. This is just a quick overview of our full-time curriculum broken down by the different modules that you'll cover. If you'd like to learn more, you're always welcome to email us at admissions at the Data Incubator. We'll be happy to provide you a more detailed curriculum overview. For our part-time program, exactly the same as our data science program, but it's stretched across 20 weeks with classes held Tuesdays and Thursdays from 7 to 9.30 p.m. Eastern. And you can expect to spend about 10 hours per week outside of class working on your assignments. And there are also office hours available each week. You'll receive the same excellent curriculum and training as our full-time program, but at a slower pace. And these sessions are still live and instructor-led, so you're able to interact with your instructors and peers and ask questions. Similar to our full-time data science program, our full-time data engineering program lasts for eight weeks as well, about 30 to 40 hours per week outside of class working on your assignments. Again, here is the modules here broken down. If you want a more detailed curriculum, please email us. We'll be happy to go over our different program offerings. So that is just a, a little bit about TDI and our programs. I will now pass to our instructor, Anna, here to lead us through our presentation, and then we'll come back on at the end to help answer any questions. Thank you so much, Sarah. So I am going to share my screen now. Just give me one second. There we go. So. As you all know from the title of uh, today's webinar, we will be talking about data ethics. So um, data science tools and techniques are sort of used nowadays for all sorts of applications. Very many positive things that you can do with data science tools, drive business decisions, of course, solve problems that used to be too complex to solve. You can gain new insights, create new opportunities, uh, boost revenue, improve customer service, all sorts of things. Um, but using data also comes with responsibilities and the field as a whole sort of continues to face ethical questions and challenges. And this is what we'll talk about today. So sort of in general, ethics refers to the perception of something being right or uh, good or just or unjust. Um, in the context of data science, we are talking about the proper or acceptable or appropriate data acquisition, data storage, data usage, and that takes into account human rights, um, as well as how to use machine learning and AI for greater good and not to harm. So data ethics basically asks, is this the right thing to do? Can we do better? The main ethical challenges that I will talk about today are sort of in three topics. Uh, privacy rights is one of them. Often data that we work with is someone's personal information. It must be properly acquired and used while maintaining privacy. We will also talk about data validity. So data scientists are responsible for verifying to the greatest of our abilities uh, that the data that we are working with and that we are using is indeed valid and not corrupt. And also algorithm appropriateness and fairness. I'll talk about models that are potentially perpetuating injustices. If models need to make ethical decisions, what are we choosing for them to prioritize? Things like that. We would like to think that using machine learning algorithms to perform jobs that used to be performed by a person will bring only positive outcomes like 
automating processes, cost savings, increasing speed, increasing accuracy, having a larger consistency. Um, we hope or expect that an AI system is more precise and reliable than a human would be, and hoping that the outcomes are more fair and less prone to injustice or social prejudice. All of that, though, can be cannot be far further from the truth when data science tools are applied um, without us being aware of the ethical challenges that I'm going to talk about today. So we are going to start with data privacy. So in this context, privacy rights is about ethical practices regarding personal data and also just in general, the data that we leave behind as part of our sort of daily digital footprints. Yeah, we're, for example, just browsing the web, shopping online, or using social media, using a plethora of apps and uh, just digital services that we use daily. All of that data that is being collected um, is sort of needs to be properly collected, properly stored. Um, data privacy rights is about how that data is used and also about data ownership. So it's best maybe to discuss this topic with a couple examples, a couple potentially problematic examples um, where data privacy rights are breached. So one of the first things we can talk about when it comes to data privacy, one of the first principles of data privacy is that an individual has ownership over their personal information. It's just like it's considered stealing if you take an item that doesn't belong to you. It's not legal or ethical uh, to collect someone's personal data without their consent. Nowadays, a common way to obtain consent is through digital privacy policies through which users will agree to a company's terms and conditions. Or when you visit a website, you'll get pop-ups asking if you agreed that a website tracks your online behavior with, with cookies. Um, this can therefore then be legal for your dead data to be collected, but there are examples where this can still be problematic. Here's an example from 2014 when OkCupid revealed that as part of a social experiment, they at some point tested what happens when they tell people who are poor matches that they are a perfect pair and vice versa. And they said that they basically wanted to test if people fall in love because the app told them that they're a match? Um, or was it the case that their matching algorithm actually correctly predicts who would fall in love and who would not? So it was basically testing their algorithm. Um, when this came to light, um, many users were, of course, upset. Um, OkCupid's okay, co-founder at the time said, guess what, everybody? If you use the internet, you're subject to hundreds of experiments all the time on every site. That's how websites work. And indeed, the company's privacy policy does state that it uses data it collects to sort of research and test the effectiveness of its site. Um, and most websites and apps indeed do this. And indeed, they do state this in the agreements we sign. Um, so this caused some uproar, but um, they claimed informed consent because of the agreement that users signed when signing up for the service. There is a question here of really informed consent and what counts as informed consent. Apps and websites use lengthy terms of surveys to de detail everything that they track, everything they might do with your data. And you're not alone if you do not bother to read that carefully and you just click accept. Many users don't have the time or the patience uh, to read along this very detailed reports on every item. So when users then agree, did they give consent? They did. But as a user though, it isn't informed consent per se. So the bottom line being when companies then use this data in ways that users are unhappy about, this can cause serious issues at a minimal 
potentially reputational issues for the company. Another example of a data privacy um, topic is our right for the data that we leave behind to be stored properly and securely. Um, an example of when things went wrong, and there are so many examples like this, unfortunately, where our data is not stored safely. Um, one example is the April 2021 uh, Facebook breach. So the personal information of um, over 500 million Facebook users was found uh, posted online by a hacker, including people's names and birthdays and phone numbers and um, email addresses. And at the time, according to Facebook, they were claiming that that stolen data was originally scraped years before, and it was due to some vulnerability that they already fixed in 2019. So people don't worry. We all still happily use Facebook, or some of us do, some of us don't. But um, this happens, unfortunately, quite a bit where data is not stored as properly as it should be. Um, another topic when it comes to data privacy rights is data being collected, being sold. Data collection and sale of data are actually a huge part of the modern digital economy. From any online shop to just Google and again, Facebook and any website um, will use user data and it's used for everything from sales to marketing to good looking up user experience, improving user experience, uh, used for product development and other things. We are just each such a rich source of information for companies about what we like, what we buy, who we are. And companies collect that data about us nonstop. Yeah, what you click on, what you buy, what you post, who you match with on dating apps, what cars you drive in car sharing apps. Every company tracks everything you do they collect that data either to use it themselves or to sell it. So you have likely experience, experienced the results of this yourself where you, for example, were got a call from a telemarketer or somebody where you were wondering, where did they get my phone number? Or how some brand you never shopped at gave you, send you start sending you emails. So some of this selling of data can be illegal, but some of it is legal. So data can be sold to third parties. Um, when this happens, though, without our knowledge or consent, it can be problematic. That happened in April 2020. Um, New York Times article alleged that Zoom engaged in basically um, undisclosed sharing of the information with third parties during user conversations. Zoom was accused of transmitting a user's data to a third party system that then matched that individual's um, information with their LinkedIn profiles. And apparently it did that even when somebody signed into Zoom um, as anonymously, they would that tool would still the data their data would still be shipped to third party. The tool would still connect them with their respective LinkedIn profile, and therefore the person would sort of um, have their real name revealed to other users on on Zoom, despite presumably trying to keep it private by logging in anonymously. So Zoom disabled the tool after the uproar, they removed it from their offerings. But the point here is that this tool was a third party tool and Zoom sent users data to there without sort of people being aware of that. So um, something something uh, to, to be aware of here as sort of another example of where things were not quite done properly. In general, Customers or consumers typically expect, sort of have data privacy expectations. And some of the things that people expect is to be left alone. So to not have their data be collected and then be harassed by telemarketers and, and et cetera. Um, to have our identity protected so that any sensitive information is, is, is protected. To have some control over that data. To be forgotten when consumers ask to be deleted from a database, they should be able to be forgotten. Um, to be to know when they're interacting with AI so that they know, am I talking to a human or is this uh, some AI that I'm interacting with? And they also expect to know how that data is being used. 
Um, this has had some sort of regulation uh, in the EU, for example. EU has accepted this Europe's General Data Protection Regulation, or GDPR. Um, so in EU under GDPR, which is sort of designed to for data privacy protections, companies must disclose the data um, that's being collected and disclose how the data will be used. The data that is being collected has to be minimized. So if there's something that the company is not ne needing and is not essentially used right now, they cannot be collecting that. Um, users get to be informed about the data that is being held and users when asked, um, when they ask to be removed, they need to be removed upon request. This kind of opens up a little bit of an interesting topic when you're talking about machine learning, because when, let's say, you have a huge database of users, you train a machine learning model on that data, then some of the users ask to be removed, you remove them. Does that mean you need to retrain the model? Because in principle, that data was used to inform your model. So that can go pretty deep. Um, and then the lastly here, as you see, um, in under GDPR, automated decisions need to be explainable, which is again another thing with machine learning. Some models are have that interpretability, and some don't. And under GDPR, when a user asks, "Why was I denied a loan?" if that was an AI that made that decision, they have to get an explanation for why they were um, rejected. For example, there is no federal data privacy law like GDPR in the U.S. at the moment. There are some national laws, some some laws that have been put in place to regulate certain sort of data in certain industries, but um, nothing like GDPR yet, um, but probably it's going in that direction. So what does that mean for sort of a practicing data scientist and, and data analyst individually? Um, data scientists and data analysts should be educated and e equipped sort of with the knowledge and skills relating to data privacy. Um, and that includes, of course, some security basics. Um, this can mean just simple things like anonymizing data. Yeah. Every customer was as they give your company, for example, consent to collect, store, and analyze um, their data, potentially personally identifiable information. That doesn't mean they want it publicly available, of course. Yeah. So, or that they want it used unless absolutely necessary. So here it's of course important that if that data is collected to ensure that it is stored properly in a secure database, so it doesn't end up in wrong hands. And one more step that can be done is de-identifying a data set. A data set is de-identified sort of when all these pieces of personally identifiable information is removed. So it's basically just anonymized the data. Um, but all of that may not even go far enough, right? A, a, a privacy preserving data scientist would also have some training in techniques that allow models to be trained without potentially having direct access to the data or without copy, having to copy that data to a central storage and instead just leaving the data on the device that captured the data or learning to use techniques that prevent models from storing sensitive information about the data, so things like that. So this was about data privacy. Um, the next topic I mentioned is data validity. So this is basically about, um, and this is a very essential part of, of any data handling. Um, and it's about sort of checking whether you um, have the data that's valid and that is not corrupt. So um, it's basically, trying to see whether you're, you know, collecting information, analyzing data or preparing it uh, for presentations or whatever it may be. If you're working with data, if your data isn't accurate, you're not going to get good results, of course. So data validity is this practice of really checking the integrity and accuracy um, and the structure of your data before it's being used. Um, so can the data that you have be trusted? Yeah. Uh, or is it corrupt? Um, in this case, it just means ensuring the data accuracy and quality. Just as an example, you may have features that are, let's say, self-reported, and that can be questionable. Yeah, If you ask people about their age or about their weight, 
or if you're trying to evaluate teachers by asking students how much they studied, for example, and you take how much students study as, as a feature, if students are self-reporting that, you have to ask yourself how valid that data is, things like that. Um, and also questions like, is the data representative of what we would like it to capture? Um, it could be that I might just have a specific subset of the population that my data sort of um, is about. And that means that if I take that data and draw conclusions from that, um, I may get the wrong conclusions. Yeah. So for example, if I want to use uh, Twitter feeds to represent public opinion, Twitter users are generally skewed toward probably being younger and richer than the general opinion or the general public. So either way, it's not a representative sample. And of course, also is our data measuring what we intend it to measure. So all of that is sort of about data validity and is an important part of um, sort of a step in once we have the data to really ask these questions before we proceed to, for example, build any algorithms, any machine learning models. And speaking of machine learning models, there's sort of my next or third topic, um, algorithm appropriateness, algorithm fairness. Even when intentions are good, the outcome of a data analysis can, or a machine learning model, can cause um, inadvertent harm. And um, this can mean to individuals or groups of people. And that's kind of what I wanna talk about next. So fairness, appropriateness of machine learning algorithms. And maybe the first example I can give here when it comes to algorithm appropriateness is, let's say we think of self-driving cars. Self-driving cars will need to make split second decisions to avoid endangering human lives. So what kinds of ethical kind of kind of ethical principles we want them to follow? Um, researchers asked this uh, question to um, in a poll. This was a sort of a classic philosophical exercise that is known as the trolley problem. Essentially, they they posed a series of questions or moral dilemmas to people involving, um, let's say you have a self-driving car that has brakes, but let's say that suddenly the brakes stop working. Um, and they asked people, should then the car swerve to avoid a group of pedestrians, but which would end up killing the driver? Or should they kill the people that are walking on foot to spare the driver? So um, in that question, they added, does it matter if the pedestrians are men or women, or if they are children or older people? or if they are doctors or criminals, yeah, things like that. So just, just a general sort of classic philosophical trolley problem. Um, on aggregate, people everywhere sort of pretty much believe that the moral thing is for the car to um, spare the young over the old, uh, to spare humans over animals um, and lives of many over lives of few kind of a general trend, but there are some regional differences and cultural differences in how people answer this question. Um, but either way here, the, my point is that before we sort of allow self-driving cars to make any ethical decisions that they might be forced to make, we need to sort of be aware of this. And we probably don't want the car companies uh, or the machine learning engineers alone to design these moral algorithms we probably will all want to be part of this conversation if self-driving cars are the future. So just one example of model appropriateness. I wanna give another example of the dilemma of algorithm fairness. So while we would like to think, as I mentioned at the beginning, that artificial intelligence means more precision and systems that are more reliable than a human, and also that the outcomes would be more fair and less prone to injustice. After all, machine learning algorithms are just sort of machines churning cold, hard data, yeah? That is sort of, <laughs> cannot be further from the truth, turns out. Um, an example of that is um, from the 1980s where St. George's Hospital Medical School in the UK thought a computer program would make the admissions process fairer. Turned out to do just the opposite. So 
the main motivation was to make the admissions process more efficient and more fair, um, such that it would sort of remove any inconsistencies in the way that the admissions staff carried out their duties when they were doing admissions. So they are first round resume filter. The model was trained on screening records from previous years. So basically from whatever the human panel did in the past was the data that went into the model and the model turned out to be racist. So essentially it turned out that race was actually not part of the data. It was explicitly taken out, but there were other features that were essentially proxies for that, like the model favored European sounding names and things like that turned out that it was just perpetuating what the human panel was already doing. So while it's not to say that unequal paths to opportunity are in general anything new, uh, it's also not the case that using AI um, makes um, a sort of take, makes the injustices go away. So if anything, um, using AI on the real world data that is biased already, and simply just means that unequal paths to opportunity have now reincarnated as automated AI. Another example of, of that basically um, is predictive policing. The idea is that we have all of this data on crime. Why don't we plug that data into a machine learning algorithm and have a, a model that predicts crime so that can predict in what area is police needed when, so that then they can sort of use their resources better and police can show up at the right place at the right time. Sounds like a good idea, yeah? Um, but determining whether AI crime fighting solutions are actually a good idea depends on whether the benefits outweigh the risks that accompany them. And one of the risks with predictive policing is that any bias conclusions that can be drawn from AI um, can arise and that can be based on factors like ethnicity or gender and age. So there are quite a few of predictive policing solutions or products um, out there. CompStat is one of them. Um, it's a computerization and quantification program that um, is used by police departments. And it was originally set up by the New York City Police Department uh, in the 90s. Um, there is also a solution called PredPol, which is an algorithm that is supposed to make predictions based on existing crime reports. The problem with all of this is just that crimes aren't equally reported everywhere. And the readings basically that, um, that the data provides to law enforcement then basically could just simply copy these biases in reporting um, over uh, an area. So when police, for example, use, let's say, PredPol to decide where to patrol, they could end up essentially over-policing areas that are already over-policed to start with. So when these um, kind of algorithms were investigated, they were found to target neighborhoods with people of color and areas with higher rates of poverty. So the way that these algorithms work is that as police intervene in a given area, that is reported back to the algorithm. Um, and as crime is found in that area, that basically is reported back to the algorithm as success, as the algorithm takes that as an indication that, oh, the predictions are correct, which means that it will just send more police to that same area, which just means that policing an area drives more policing in that area. So data is collected basically as a byproduct of police activity. Predictions are made on the basis of these patterns learned from this data and don't necessarily pertain to future instances of crime on the whole. It's that the model is basically selecting its data, its future data, and, and it's trained on that data. And as such, it's perpetuating bias. This is actually also called, it's called systematic bias when you have a model that basically chooses its, its own data and as such just perpetuates uh, bias. Another example of problematic algorithms or in algorithm fairness is um, the impact 
um, example. So in 2009 in Washington, D.C., public schools implemented IMPACT. Um, it was a new system for evaluating teachers based on their estimated effect on test scores of students. Um, so this AI was composed, it made predictions, and then in 2011, 206 teachers were uh, laid off for ineffectiveness. And that included several of teacher who teachers who had excellent classroom evaluations, um, great relationships with students and the school and the community as a whole. So here, right, the goal seemed good. We should weed out bad teachers. What could go wrong? The problem is that it's far too complex to measure a teacher's contributions to child's grades using AI. There's far too little data per teacher. You would need to test a teacher on thousands or millions of students if you actually wanted to get a good model. The features that were used were questionable. There were questionable proxies measuring student improvement. What, it, what measures student improvement? It was also shown that some of the some of what they did was they used the let's say a last year's student scores and compared them to student scores at the end of the school year, um, and it turned out that some of the previous year's student scores were inflated because some of the teachers um, were basically cheating so to make themselves look good in that year. So essentially, some of the students had inflated scores coming into a school year, um, which meant goes back to data validity, right? That we talked about uh, before. So all of that was certainly a problem. And another very big, if not the biggest problem is that there's no feedback. There was no feedback telling the model if it's doing right or is it off track. Without feedback, models basically will define their own reality and just kind of use it to justify their results. The model predictions were followed blindly. The students, the teachers, were just fired without actually having there any feedback loop to measure if the model is even a good, makes even good predictions or not. So when we're talking about all of this, um, there's a couple crucial questions I think that need to be asked um, when it comes to model fairness. Um, with our every move tracked right, including the data, as I mentioned, from any interaction that we do digitally, also data from our genomes and patterns in our diet and our sleep and our exercise, obviously our spending patterns, our online browsing, all of that, right, is being used to predict whether we should get a loan, whether we are going to be accepted in a given college to predict crime, how much we should sort of pay for our insurance, for example. And maybe it may seem like using AI with very personal data or individualized data sounds like a good idea. It's a move towards the individual. Everything will be customized and selective for each individual. The trouble is that it's not. Uh, this is it's not actually customized to the individual. People, if machine learning algorithms are used on human data like that, people are placed into groups that you cannot see, placed into groups that supposedly resemble us, uh, uh, so that, that fit us, based on some metrics and features that were chosen by the modeler, whoever put together the machine learning al algorithm. So what is crucial here to be aware of or to mitigate some of these issues are, I think one is what is the objective of the modeler? Um, is the objective efficiency? Um, is it making more money, usually? Is it fairness and ethics? Usually not. Um, yeah, and it should be all of that, yeah, not just one thing. And sometimes it turns out that if we want to act ethically, we need to sacrifice maybe model performance um, if we want to comply with data privacy guidelines, if we want to keep our model fair. The other question I think is what goes into the model? What proxies are being used? So with questionable examples that I mentioned of machine learning being used in unfair ways, if you will, it's often that it's what the modelers think is relevant is being used. So use of questionable proxies, 
For example, credit score is being used more and more to predict whether a given candidate will be a responsible worker and should be hired. Or for example, when measuring how good certain schools are, um, proxy for um, how much students appreciate their education there is amount of donations alumni of a college give. Maybe it's more of a measure of how rich the alumni are than how good that education was, things like that. Yeah. So what goes into the model matters. Machine learning algorithms learn based on the data they're trained with. So if we give them poor features or unrepresentative data sets, of course, we'll have algorithms that um, favor some outcomes over others. And then I think the third question is this feedback that I already mentioned. How do we know that a model is working? How do we know uh, kind of what its outcome is causing? We need that feedback. A lot of ethically questionable data science applications lack this unbiased feedback or testing. Um, as we saw in the couple examples I gave, um, algorithms lack sort of internal ability to test their own assumptions. Um, and in many instances, they also lack the ability to check whether they are making accurate predictions. Um, so machine learning, machine learning algorithms that do not receive appropriate feedback about their performance will are not kind of being kept in check. We cannot simply put machine learning uh, algorithms in place, just put them in production and use them and just expect them to work well. That's kind of what they did in the example of um, in the DC schools. Yeah, as in, let's just put it out there and just expect it to work well. It was trained on data, so it must be fair. So if there's a student that, so a teacher that is praised by the principal and the community and all the students love them and say that they're doing great, well, that must be a manipulative teacher. The data set that they're not doing well, so we're going to fire them. Yeah, We cannot simply put a model in place and use it and expect that it works well. It has to have that, that feedback. Algorithm development is iterative and depends on constant sort of cycle of feedback, evaluating and tweaking the model to get best performance. All of that said, if that feedback is not appropriate though, if it's a biased feedback, that can also be the cause of the problem, especially if you have algorithms that are written in such a way that they are constantly retrained on based on the feedback that they uh, basically are getting, right? If you keep collecting the data based on uh, on the examples on which you apply your model, then your models are selecting the data they're being trained on. And then the models are just perpetuating what they're predicting. So in the case of biased feedback, that's actually the cause of the problem uh, partly. So failure to sort of provide appropriate feedback or evaluate the model performance is what the problem is. And that can result in discriminatory or kind of unjust um, results. Um, at this uh, stage, I would like to mention the Oxford Munich code. So if you're curious, um, I invite you to check that out. It's basically an initiative to define a code of conduct for professionals working with um, data science teams or working in data science. It um, addresses common ethical dilemmas that data scientists from the industry and academia may face. And some of sort of the um, advice I kind of picked out here, just a couple of them. So when it comes to algorithm fairness, what can we do to not perpetuate bias and not use um, machine learning models that are unjust or, or, or um, unfair um, is we want to make sure that your training is your training data basically is fair and representative. Um, and ask yourself if we've checked for any possible sources of bias. You kind of having bias in mind is already kind of a big part of this. Um, of course, it's also important that the team is diverse, that the team reflects um, diversity of opinions, as it says here, backgrounds and kinds of thoughts. So that, right, if um, the data science team is diverse, it will be easier for people to kind of spot different things that may be problematic. 
um, and also testing for fairness with respect to different user groups if we deploy our model. Yeah, those are kind of the questions there. And in terms of data privacy, um, the things that you kind of would want to ask yourself is, do we have user consent? What kind of user consent do we need for the data that we would like to collect or use? Um, do we have mechanisms for gathering consent? Um, are you, our users informed about what they're consenting to? Are we being transparent enough? Um, and do we have a plan to protect and secure that data? How is the data going to be stored? What is our sort of security procedure there? So this is just a little glimpse of it. Um, and I should also say that the field as such has quite some gray zones still. Um, so it's something that's kind of still being created and it's being more and more part of, I guess, something that's on, on everyone's uh, radar. Um, so with that, um, I just want to say that if your role includes data analysis or um, writing or training or handling any machine learning algorithms, um, consider how they could potentially violate any of these ethical principles I mentioned today. So as I said, there's still many gray zones, but data ethics is here to stay. It will likely become a key part of responsibilities of data scientists job. And it kind of already is to some degree. So um, United States will likely follow um, and sort of have some future implementation of a version like the GDPR in the European Union. Um, but basically, while data science and specifically data collection and um, sort of building any machine learning models um, on its own, it's of course not inherently unethical in any way, shape, or form. There are just many kind of practices you should be aware of in order to a just save your organization from legal issues or reputational issues or things like that. Um, and be just in general, uh, and in my opinion, this is maybe as important, if not more, try to use data science for the greater good uh, in ways that are fair and just to everyone. And I hope to have kind of convinced you with a couple examples here that you should not assume that that's a given. Thank you so much, Anna. Well, if you have questions for Anna, she will stay on. Our Q&A is open, so please drop your questions in there. We'll open it up to questions in just a few minutes. We're going to go over a few more slides about our programs. So hopefully you all can see my screen and we will get started. So we could ask quite a bit about our programs if we offer scholarships and the answer is yes, we do. We admit two types of students to our programs. One, our fellows are offered tuition-free scholarships for our full-time program. We offer a limited number of these scholarships to highly qualified candidates. And then we also admit scholars into our programs. Scholars will pay tuition to participate in our program. They're not required to interview solely with our hiring partner network and may maintain their current employment. Same access to curriculum and resources and tools, regardless of scholarship status for our students. And then also we just wanted to note that Fellow, full tuition scholarships are not offered for the part-time program. We do also offer partial scholarships. So we are going to continue to offer our Women of Excellence in STEM scholarship and our Equity and Diversity in Data scholarship in our spring 2023 cohort. These scholarships aim to help remove barriers and provide opportunities for women, veterans, LGBTQIA+, and students from racial and ethnic backgrounds that are traditionally underrepresented in technical roles. Our scholarship applications are open now, so please visit thedataincubator.com slash programs and scholarships to review the qualifications and to apply today before our early admissions deadline for our spring cohort. A big component of our program that we really pride ourselves on is not only helping our students to grasp data science concepts, but also getting you a job in that field. For our data science fellowship program, 97% of the students that go through our program are currently employed outside of academia and 88% are employed within six months of completing the program. That's really part of the challenge, not only learning the content, but being able to transition into a data role. And that's where our program stands out because we really help you to do both. So where are our graduates now? Where are they working? What are they doing? Well, our graduates are working in over 55 different industries, ranging from 
software, IT, financial services, and biotech, many more. And some of the typical job titles that we see are data scientist, data analyst, data engineer, research scientist, software developer. These titles and roles vary depending on the company and industry, but these are just some of the roles that we've placed in the past. We've also seen that our graduates are earning 16% more than industry standard, which is also very exciting to see. Here's a short list of some of our data science hiring partners. Many of them are also hiring for data engineers roles as well. If you'd like to see a more detailed list of our hiring partners, please email us. We'll be happy to walk you through that as well. And we do also offer financial options for our students. So in addition to our scholarships, we've partnered with LEAP to provide an income sharing agreement. It's a great option for a lot of our students. You can participate in our program with just a deposit down, and you won't be required to make any payments until you've graduated and are working and earning more than $40,000 annually. We also have two additional finance options through LEAP, a tuition installment plan and a contingent payment plan. So the tuition installment plan allows you to make fixed monthly payments over 12 months. The CPP or the contingent payment plan is kind of similar to the ISA in a sense that you're able to participate in our program with just a deposit down and you won't be required to make any payments until you've graduated and are working and earning more than $50,000 annually. After that, you'll make fixed monthly payments over 24 months. Another great option for a lot of our students are we provide loans through Ascent and they offer three different options, one being deferred repayment, interest-only repayments or immediate repayment options, just depending on what works best for your situation. And lastly, for many of our part-time programs, companies are willing to sponsor or pay for their employees to go through our program. It's a win-win. You get to learn great stuff in the evening and be able to apply it to your job during the day. So if this is something that you think your company would be interested in or you'd like to present to them, we do have a letter we can provide you that will help you lay out all the program and all the benefits of attending. So where are we right now? Well, we run multiple cohorts a year. Our fall cohort just graduated last month, but our and our winter cohort actually starts in January, uh, but applications for our spring 2023 cohorts are open now. The spring cohorts, the full-time cohort will run from April 3rd through May 26th, and the part-time cohort will run from April 3rd to August 18th. And again, the full-time program is eight weeks and the part-time is 20 weeks. Just some specifics about the application. We ask that you submit your application by January 6th for the early admissions deadline. You'll then have 72 hours to complete the coding challenge from the time that you open it, and the challenge deadline is January 9th. You can't complete the challenge unless you submit the application. So just in general, I recommend you complete the application and challenge sooner than later to avoid any technical issues. We're unable to reopen the application and challenge after that deadline. That is for our early admissions deadline. We do also offer regular admissions after our early admission cycle. If you're wondering what the difference is, but we evaluate applicants on a first come first serve basis. So if you just want a better chance of getting a fellow spot, being selected for one of our partial tuition scholarships, or just knowing earlier if you've been accepted into the program to secure financing, I absolutely recommend applying for early admissions. We also offer a priority enrollment package for all of our programs. If you apply in early admissions, which includes access to a Python training course, early access to career services with a one in a one on one with a data science resume writer, as well as two thousand dollars off your tuition if you pay directly. So if you're interested in applying for our program, which I hope that you are, you can go to the datingcubator.com slash apply to submit your application. And if you have any questions about your specific situation, the presentation today or just going through the application process, please reach out to us at admissions.thedatingcubator.com. We would be more than happy to answer your questions. So at this time, I will open up the Q&A. If you have a question, please drop it in there. I know there are a couple in there already. I think a lot of these are going to be directed towards you, Anna. But this first question here is, why do you believe in building information age literacy and skills? And what huge social functions do you see becoming accomplished? Um, I'm not sure exactly what Eric has in mind there for um, in terms of do you mean believing in building your skills as data scientists or just kind of in general um, information age literacy and skills across the kind of general population where everybody should be able to have a little bit of those skills. I'm assuming you mean the latter based on the second question you asked there. Um, so in terms of just building skills as data scientists, I think it's um, 
a good idea to um, have people have these skills, given that they are very much in demand and that um, you can do a lot of good with it uh, while also get a job easily because there's um, a lot of demand for data scientists. But in general, if you're talking about just building um, kind of digital skills and literacy in people in general um, and having everyone have these skills, um, just because basically it would mean equality, right? Um, or it is inequal inequality when only certain people have it. Um, we live in a digital age that's not going to change. So certainly, um, I think that that having giving people those skills is very important because otherwise they're left behind. Um, so um, certainly, um, I would say that the the first thing that comes to mind for me is just kind of equality um, in having people, yeah, have that opportunity to learn that. We have another question here. So the, thanks for the great talk. What do you think bears the responsibility for training data science or who do you think bears the responsibility for training data scientists and data ethics? Data scientists, companies, academia, government, et cetera. I'm going to say all of those. I do think that certainly the um, sort of it's on data scientists um, alone to some degree, um, certainly to be aware of that, to to learn them themselves, but certainly um, companies um, employing data scientists, I think would definitely have to sort of put emphasis on this part as well and have um, some training and some focus on, for, on that. Um, but I would also say that it's it, it, it should be part of uh, programs. Um, and I think it is more and more, um, sort of that there is a, that, that topic that's also uh, just in education of data scientists that it's included. Uh, but I would say everything you listed. So I would say yes, from, from data scientists themselves, exactly the companies where, where they work to um, yes, government as well, I would say. And then our last question in here, can you say more about population skew considerations and how data scientists can ethically increase literacy? For example, Twitter as not a representative sample, what platforms attempt to accomplish equity in their membership and how do the big companies attempt to address this? Uh -huh. I think um, if I understand your, your questions correctly, you're referring to the fact that um, the, the fact that Twitter is not a representative sample means that people are not using it equally. And are there any pushes for that happening? Do, do the do big tech companies kind of uh, address the fact that you know not everybody uses Twitter or other digital services, um, and I don't believe so. I don't, not to my knowledge, that Twitter or TikTok or Snapchat would be interested in kind of other than for you know business financial reasons um, to spread to so that everyone across, let's say, the um, different um, kind of. Um, layers of, of society would use it. Um, and I don't think that there's a push for that in general. So if as a data scientist, you're looking for a representative sample of, um, um, it's very difficult to get one. So um, there are certain pieces of information that for example, there are things like the census or some other things where basically people are asked certain questions across the board, across the country. Um, but otherwise, most of the apps or digital services um, will have some segment of the population that uses it, and you need to be aware of that. And again, I'm not aware of any companies having, other than for spreading spreading to more customers, have this particular kind of thing in mind to increase that literacy, to increase that everybody knows how to use it and that uses it for the purpose of kind of equity in their membership. Not that I know of. Yeah. Well, those are all of the questions we have time for today. If we didn't get to your question or if you didn't get a chance to type it in there, please email us again at missions at the I think that email is in the chat. We'll be happy to answer questions about the program or forward some of your questions to on about the presentation today. But I want to thank Anna again for your time. We really appreciate when you're able to join us. You give such excellent presentations. And thank you, everyone, for joining us today. We hope you have a great rest of your day.